Hello and welcome to Healthcare Leadership in Action, a podcast from the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management. This podcast is about equipping you with the knowledge and skills you need to become a better leader in your health system. My name is Angus and I'm FM Lamb's Head of Professional Services and Innovation. So join us as we discover what it takes to put healthcare leadership in action. So welcome everyone. I'm Angus Waite. I'm FM Lamb's Head of Professional Services and Innovation. And this week we are talking with Dr. Ming Ka Chan and Dr. Simon Morali. Dr. Shan is a paediatrician and co-director of the Office of Leadership Education at Rady Faculty Health Sciences. She is responsible for facilitating leadership development for the five health colleges and is the lead for equity, diversity, inclusivity and social justice, all at the University of Manitoba. She is chair of Sanakondu Leadership and Governance, a multinational learning community focused on health leadership education for medical students and residents. And she's also an associate editor of our very own journal, BMJ Leader. Uh, Dr. Morali is an academic and is currently senior lecturer in healthcare management at the University of Manchester and director of the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Programme, which is an MSc in healthcare leadership. He also sits on the FMLM Accreditation Committee uh, and is co-editor of Healthcare Management, published by McGraw-Hill. So welcome to you both. Thank you, Angus. Thanks so much. So we're we're really lucky to have uh, these two on our podcast. Both have got extensive research interests in the field of healthcare leadership. Um, and I thought I'd just kick things off maybe to you, Simon. You know, you've come from an academic background. How did you come to be interested in this field of medical leadership? Thanks, Angus. It hides a a former career, really, as a healthcare manager. And it was as a healthcare manager managing surgical departments that I first got interested in healthcare and medical leadership. Doctors who had been trained for 15 years operating on liver resections in the morning and then after lunch being asked to go to meetings and suddenly perform as excellently in meetings around service design and planning for which they'd received zero hours of training. And it got me thinking, doctors management and leadership and and it's been really a kind of 20 odd year interest in in how we can support doctors to become better leaders fantastic thanks simon uh, and for you minka thanks uh, angus for the question uh, so i think uh, it actually started while i was in training and one of the areas that i really noticed is that i, I had a strong desire to help support uh, individuals uh, to thrive Um, And so that's evolved over time, but very much leadership development was one of the key strategies uh, by which to do so. Uh, So very much uh, aligned with uh, what Simon was saying. You're you're based in Canada. Obviously, our audience are predominantly based in the UK. Could you outline for them what the medical leadership pathway looks like in Canada? Sure, I guess. Uh, So it's much less uh, formal uh, than it is in the other parts of the world, like the UK or um, uh, Australia. Um, so I think um, it's much more varied and uh, individualized and in some ways less formal. Uh, so there are, mm-hmm. and there are many options. So there are mm-hmm. masters in uh, arts in leadership, for example, at Royal Roads University. Uh, other universities have a, uh, like the University of Toronto has a, a master's of science in system leadership and innovation. Um, and of course, uh, many uh, choose the uh, master's of uh, business uh, administration route, so the MBA um, then there are also um, what I call achieving a recognized standard or credential based on longitudinal de- development, much like the uh, Canadian uh, Certified Physician Executive Program. Um, and uh, for myself, as, an, as one example, I really look at uh, individualized um, longitudinal development. And some of these are three to four day intensives where you immerse yourself and may um, focus on a specific uh, area or um, depending on your area of interest. So for example, for medical and health professional uh, educators, we often have a, um, uh, they complete CLIMB uh, and CLIMB 2. So that's the Canadian Leadership Institute on uh, for medical educators. Um, and then there are also, uh, I guess, either provincial or uh, university-based programs uh, for health leadership uh, development. Uh, some of these may be for uh, uh, general uh, groups, and then others are more specific. So for emerging leaders in academic medicine or specific identities like women in leadership. So I think we have a much more individualized approach uh, rather than a one body organizing um, that for uh, the me- its members. 
Interesting. A, a lot of the evidence we hear about in the UK uh, in terms of the impact of medical leadership comes from America. And the perception we have here is that it seems much more common for doctors to become chief execs and so on of, of large hospitals. Uh, and, and in the UK, that doesn't seem to happen so often. What's the situation in Canada? I think uh, there's a mix. Uh, I think that uh, oh. we we do see uh, physicians taking on a variety of um, health system roles, both on the clinical realm as well as the academic realm. Uh, so I think it really uh, varies. Certainly at my university, uh, there's a good mix. And I think it's about um, you know what we bring to the table, both experientially as well as our credentials. Um, uh, to have, um, you know, to have the best person for the job. I hope that's the goal. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, and it's interesting. I mean, Simon, um, you know, obviously you're based in the UK and, you know, it, it does feel like medical leadership is something that clinicians view with a you know, reasonable degree of cynicism or scepticism. Do you think that's a fair statement? Um, and what can we, what can we do about that? Thanks, Angus. I think it probably is, actually, because, first of all, do they or anyone really know what it is and, and how it's defined? And I always talk about, is it leadership for, is it leadership by, or is it leadership of doctors? And it means different things. So if you can't define it, or if you define it only by position and status, then you can argue that doesn't appeal to the broad range of doctors. In terms of scepticism, well, medical leadership traditionally was seen as something done by the senior doctor in the department or was rotated around senior doctors on a three-year basis, partly because no one wanted to do it, and partly because there's no established career path and the lead would have to rejoin the rank and file after their tenure, so they didn't want to cause any disquiet amongst their colleagues. Thirdly, it was seen as a place where the not as good doctor went to keep them out of trouble, rather than being somewhere that, like the rest of medicine, was a place for competitive selection. And therefore it lacked appeal because it differed from traditional medical career progression, which is supremely competitive, and finally, I think it was seen as probably doing a bit of the devil's work. We often hear about the dark side of, of leadership, and it's a very unhelpful characteristic of the tensions that exist between policy and management on one side and clinical care resources, well-being on the other. Um, what can we do about it? Well, look, lots has been going on since 1990s, the introduction of the clinical director role at Guy's and Thomas's. It's recognized that medical leaders and managers do exist and they need supporting. So we've seen a huge amount that's been done since then to support medical leadership, notably the work of FMLM since 2011 in introducing standards and so on, um, but also encouraging opportunities for doctors in training, as well as established doctors to gain the skills, attributes, knowledge, and behaviors to lead and manage well. Ultimately, it comes down to a cultural acceptance, and that has to be internal to the profession, but it also needs to be supported uh, by government, by regulators as a, as a good career path. So some some sort of positives there, um, but but that sort of dark side narrative is definitely one that, that that we feel in the UK. Is that familiar to you, Minka? I would say so, and I have to say, uh, Simon, you really articulated it well in terms of the the nuance there. I think it does really have to be part of our uh, culture, um, and I think one of the complexities is really around relationship. Uh, building. I think that's difficult in our um, in the busy uh, health context. I also think um, while I do believe formal leadership training is critical uh, to build that capacity and develop uh, specific skill sets, I will say that uh, there needs to be more work in the informal sphere. You know, so those op opportunities for reflection and um, feedback uh, from trusted uh, colleagues and peers that peer support, that mentorship, sponsorship, and coaching, I, I don't think that we take advantage of those aspects um, within uh, both our formal programs as well as on an ongoing basis for our leaders to develop. And so that's been um, an area that I really think uh, needs more uh, development. I think it's also the mindset, as you articulate, that everyone needs this capacity to be a leader. And I still think there's a lot of, if you look at the literature, for example, there's a lot of developmental programs that think about it, you know, tied to a specific specific role. In fact, my own career, um, I started off working on um, helping uh, resident leaders in their final year. At the time, it was called chief resident. Now, uh, be a resident lead 
for example, uh, where they have uh, specific responsibilities as the um, uh, more, one of the more senior uh, resident leaders uh, in their um, cohort uh, with a specific task. Yeah. And that was the work that I started. And then more and more, it became obvious that uh, it really was a responsibility for all to develop such capacity. Um, and then I'll, my last comment will be, I, I do think that leadership development in certain spheres uh, for all of us needs to be, um, you know, promoted and highlighted. So, you know, work in anti-racism, anti-oppression, That those are I think newer uh, in terms of the educational programming, I don't think they're new concepts, but they really need to be supported because uh, all of us, both those who are new um, uh, into healthcare and those well-established uh, have lots to learn, um, I think, and unlearn and then uh, to relearn. So I think th there are some uh, nuances in terms of the uh, development that is needed. It's interesting, isn't it? Because there do seem to be um, many things that all doctors, all clinicians need to have as leaders because they're all seen as leaders. Uh, and you've mentioned quite a few of them. Um, Simon, do you think that sort of makes it challenging that this um, perceived separation between the medical leader, which you know is is all doctors, or the sort of clinical leader, which, which would be all clinicians, and then the medical manager, and and uh, the perception possibly from some that well, I'm not a manager and therefore I'm not a leader. Yeah, it's um it's an unhelpful distinction, really. I mean, of course, we do define the, the term of leader and the term of manager differently but I think every leader does some management and, and there's an aspect of leadership within management as well and I don't think that's just special for for the medical profession as well um, you know doctors manage all the time they manage patients they manage uh, colleagues they manage systems they're doing that all the time and I think there's something that we can do to improve the image of management uh, as, a, as a real positive good management is really important as is good leadership you know, I think leadership is probably a bit sexier, you know, and it sounds better. So people want to be a leader. They want to be that type rather than a, a, be a manager. Um, and I think that creates, a, a, you know, probably a draw for some people towards that. Uh, but I think, yeah, let's recapture management. And I, I was a healthcare manager and I'm very proud to talk about being a healthcare manager. I'm an academic now um, where I lead a program. Uh, but part of that is absolutely about managing colleagues managing their expectations managing workload all those sorts of things and doctors do that really well we need to support them perhaps in some of the language of management and leadership and some of the understanding of the of the structure and the context no i'm all for the rehabilitation of non-medical managers uh <laughs> being one myself um but um Main car, you know, you're, you're a paediatrician uh, and you've worked in all sorts of different environments. You've seen a lot of probably good leadership and bad leadership. What qualities, you know, in your opinion, makes for a great clinical leader? Yeah, that's a great question, I guess. Um, so I think, you know, I'd probably start off with um, uh, humility uh, and kindness at our at our core. Um, I think that we also need to be relationship centered. And I really thrive in uh, when my leaders are, you know, open to new ideas and innovation. Uh, and at the end of the day, their core why needs to be, you know, they need to be driven to support all of us to belong and to thrive. And so ultimately, I'd say that makes for a great leader, um, both within the clinical realm, but I think also uh, within all aspects of academia, so whether that be in research, in education, um, or um, administration, um, those are factors that are uh, and qualities that will really support us um, intrinsically. Uh, and Simon, same question to you, I suppose. You've you've been at the coalface, as you mentioned, in the NHS, uh, but not as a clinician, as a as an administrator or a manager. But you've also had this sort of slightly more, um, is it fair to say, sort of detached view as a researcher in the last you know, 10, 20 years, you know, and you must have, have your own opinion on what makes for a great clinical leader. Yeah, and it, it changes. You know, I was a manager in the health service in the year 2000, the launch of the UK NHS plan under a Labour government. And we're now in 2023 and we've got a workforce plan 
under a different government after a period of austerity. So the reason I say that is because I think it's maybe not static. It depends on the context. So the qualities that are, are needed perhaps do depend on the specialty, but also, um, you know, think about crisis leadership differing from long-term strategy and visioning. Do you need different skills? So not just qualities, but competencies. But in general, and in terms of qualities, you know, leadership literatures, as Ming Kaa said, you know, will tell you that things like kindness are important. I'd say consistency of behavior is key. Compassionate mm -hmm. approaches where all colleagues are valued for what they bring, whatever their professional or occupational background, um, rather than denigrated or othered for the purposes of one-upmanship, you know, that makes a real difference. So everyone in the hospital, everyone in the community, everyone in the primary health center, you know, everyone's there for a reason. We're pushing towards improving patient care, improving population health. I think that's important. I think researchers, you could add in into that as well. And some researchers work very, very much on the cusp of the um, clinical areas as well. Ultimately, healthcare is a team sport. Consistency and compassion, however, don't mean that you have failed to hold others to account or you accept low standards. I think other qualities, be clear about expectations and how you as a leader will respond in a given situation. And next to that, it's important leaders behave ethically with integrity, they're open and transparent about decision making, even where it's contentious and even where there are constraints. Um, they should challenge poor behavior and they should always act in the wider interest of patients, carers and colleagues. You mentioned uh, you know, fear there in your answer, uh, and I'm interested, you led quite a big piece of research looking at the impact of the Care Equality Commission um, on, on quality of care. Um, CQC are often proceed with um, quite a large dose of fear by medical managers, certainly in organizations, medical directors and, and chief execs. How can they, you know, work with them better, work with regulators better um, and sort of, you know, I suppose, understand their role and understand actually how they might benefit from, um, from their um, impact? Well, I, let me first of all say it was work done by Alan Boyd, myself and Jane Ferguson. So I don't want to take full credit for that. But you're absolutely right. I think there is a perception of fear. But we have to first understand there has to be an acceptance in the UK context that because of the way that healthcare is funded through the taxpayer, that politics and government involvement is necessary and important. Um, and, and secondly, with that, the regulation of the sector as for the profession through the General Medical Council is important, and no one would argue that it shouldn't exist. Um, I think the stakes are high, and that's why people do fear it, and there is trepidation with it. But I'd ask, where does that fear come from? And um, my guess is that it probably comes from a misunderstanding of CQC's role and cynicism of their motivations. Our project, which was 2018 to 2019, worked intensely with CQC and some of its inspectors from across health and care. And we tried to understand how they work with provider staff, how they use their assessment frameworks and guidance, and how they take their regulatory decisions. And it's underpinned by eight mechanisms, which all play a part in supporting that safe delivery of care. And some of those change provider behaviors just by the fact that there is an inspection regime. So that's called anticipatory mechanisms. Some are relational. It's the influence of soft power. Some are about the information that CQC puts out there that's available for the local health community and everyone in it. And some of it's systemic, um, you know, it's about what are the wider issues of concern uh, that require um, C CQC to intervene or CQC to have a role. So I think understanding the eight types of mechanisms, and that was research carried out again by the University of Manchester and a King's Fund team, um, would really help people. The inspectors we spoke to, none went into work on a given day thinking how they could take down a provider. In fact, you know, our theory of change that we developed really focused on those relational and organizational impacts. So two-way engagement, information sharing and, decision, and discussion, um, identifying capability and opportunities, um, making sure feedback was relevant and proportionate as well, but all focused towards engaging positively. It's important, of course, that CQC at both a senior level and an inspector level get providers. They, they provide the credibility so they understand what hospitals and other providers do but government has a role as well in clarifying the frameworks within which cqc can operate but finally some of the responses or reactions you may even call them resistance come from a workforce really that's at the end of its tether and i think that's why they fear it that their their resilience is down they're worn down by years of underinvestment in facilities training and colleagues so 
I'd encourage medical leaders to engage actively with CQC. Um, psychology literatures tell us that most negative reactions to others come from fear, and that comes from ignorance. And let's be honest, we're all ignorant because of each of us will never know everything about anything. And so when CQC come around, it can feel like just another difficult thing on top of that higher acuity and demand, the fewer relative resources and so on. So get on the front foot, work with CQC, share your world, let them share their world. I think that's the best way in which to approach the regulation regime. Well, our audience can't see this, but Minkai, you were nodding along uh, furiously in that answer. Does that ring a bell with you? No, very much so. And so I would say that that's a, a very similar uh, perception. And uh, I appreciate um, your outlining about some of the steps. I think we, in general, healthcare uh, needs to have more of a philosophy of um, of prevention and um, supporting uh, prevention, and that would include in this sphere. So that's very much aligned, and you know, it really echoes that importance of of relationships. You know, we need relationships with government, we need relationships with our regulatory bodies, um, you know, or for that matter, any group or individual that's different, right? So. That uh, to me is is very much aligned to the situation in Canada, at least in my experience. I, I will say also, I, I love the approach of sort of that micro, meso, and um, macro in terms of you know where some of the solutions uh, could lie and where we could work together as leaders, um, both individually as well as collectively. Right. So you know, micro being at the individual level, uh, what we each can do. Um, uh, meso being teams, and then uh, macro being uh, our organizations and systems. And I think it needs to be that sort of multifaceted approach. Um, and that, in fact, when that's transparent and held to account, I think that also uh, reduces the uh, fear and uh, increases understanding um, that they know that as individuals, um, physicians aren't um, uh, you know, individually responsible for fixing all the problems, that it's a collective responsibility. So Yeah, very interesting. And I suppose I, another sort of comparison between Canada and the UK, you know, the, uh, the perception in the UK is often that London and the southeast of England dominate um, in, in lots of different ways, you know, that this sort of even out with healthcare, economically, socially, you name it, uh, but certainly in terms of opportunities for leadership development in healthcare uh, and advancement. Canada has its own sort of geographic vagaries uh, with, with some very large population centres, some very, very rural uh, regional centres. What problem does that pose for, for leadership development? Uh, and what have you learned in Canada that, that we might you know, take advantage of in the UK? That's, um, it's it's uh, complex. So one thing that Canada has is a, a huge landmass. And so I think like the UK, um, although not to the same degree, well, big cities, um, there's always going to be uh, well, certainly greater access to many things, uh, although I guess not to nature per se. Um, and one of the lessons I think that really came out because of both because of our geography is that we've really been developing our understanding of uh, virtual uh, healthcare uh, in terms of its provision of healthcare, as well as uh, you know virtual um, learning and teaching. And so I, I do think the pandemic itself uh, helped to really advance that further uh, on a much uh, broader scale, uh, both on the clinical side as well as for um, leadership development. And so I think we really need to harness that, um, look at models like, you know, a hub and spoke model where you can have communities of practice or learning communities developing uh, at um uh, any site, um, rural or urban uh, or remote in our, our case in, uh, in Canada. And then, um, you know, also uh, bringing them together um, uh, to uh, form uh, more broader connections and really taking advantage of the infrastructure that we uh, now have more broadly uh, to embrace uh, hybrid or high flex um, uh, uh I guess, leadership development delivery. Very interesting. Uh, Simon, what are, your, what are your thoughts on all that? It, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it, about 
uh, this split between rural and urban or or the big centres and the smaller. And Angus, you, you know, P Professor Chris Whitty gave the Keogh lecture, I think, just a couple of days ago and talked about healthcare in rural areas as well and, and trying to attract people there. You'll always get development in areas where there's a mass of people. So the big cities will have it. London will have it in the UK. Manchester will have it, Glasgow and so on. Um, but we have to think that actually there are different ways and the pandemic has perhaps given us an opportunity because as much as we know that it's good to be in person uh, there are ways in which we can access things online we have to make sure the technology is out there the skills are out there to do that um, and there's some really really great studies actually uh, I can think of a couple off the top of my head Oscar Lyons did a study on medical leadership development it was a synthesis of the literature that talked about what's really important is the ways in which people learn together. So communities of practice are really important. Um, Amy Grove at the University of Warwick has just done some work uh, on orthopedic um, trainees and surgeons around what's really important for their development. And it is something about some, some social proximity, um, but also a, a blend because we've got to make sure it's accessible. We've also got to make sure it's not privileging people who have more time and more opportunity as well. So we can talk about the classic splits of cities versus rural areas, but we do need to think about um, accessibility more widely, making some of that in person because people do get something from that proximate socialization, but also making it accessible for people who perhaps can't travel as much. And we have to think as well that we're a huge footprint healthcare. So, you know, bringing people together to do all their training together, environmentally, financially, there's a big cost to that. So let's let's take on the best bits of working online. We developed loads of skills thanks to the pandemic. We got much more used to that sort of stuff. And perhaps then we can work. Maybe there's a system where we can buddy up between some of the most advanced centers and the more rural areas. Um, but actually, you know, what's at the heart of that? The infrastructure. You need to make sure that there is both digital literacy, but digital scope for those areas. Um, and we're, we're on a much smaller footprint than Canada, but I think we face very, very similar problems. And I, and I suppose, Minkar, that sort of inclusivity element is 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 massive. And perhaps if I could draw um, on your um, experience, uh, well, on your sort of EDI experience with your role at the University of Manitoba, that sort of accessibility, whether it's geographic, technological, whatever, is is mm -hmm. hugely important, isn't it, for the types of leaders that come through the system? I think also that sense of um, belonging. You know, we talked about that it needs to be. Uh, you know, ultimately the right person for for that job at the right time, right? And and you want that context specific leadership is so critical. So I, I do think that uh, you know, to Simon's point around thinking about accessibility very broadly, um, that's what our experience with with virtual um, uh, delivery is key, and that relationship building actually comes with then when you when you develop these. Um, site-specific uh, communities of practice and then bring them together. Uh, so I think that's that's a key um, element, um, I think, too, so that they can actually envision themselves as a leader, meaning that they, they um, oftentimes, I think, especially individuals uh, from oppressed groups, don't actually see themselves uh, in the role, or they may, you know, the literature has shown that they may not actually... Um, apply or take on a leadership role uh, because they don't have all the qualities listed in that job description, uh, for example. And so I think really, um, uh, you know, to my earlier point about more, you know, mentorship and sponsorship of uh, individuals who have less access for all the different reasons that we've mentioned um, are really supported to do that work. And that can, and I think that's very individual, what that support might look like, it might be financial, it might be uh, time away. Um, oftentimes in more rural and remote communities, you might be the, um, you know, one of um, only a few um, providers. So when you leave, you leave more work for your colleagues, right? So how do we provide those opportunities and support them uh, to be able to take that time away to develop uh, their capacity uh, in different ways, I think is also, you know, one of those infrastructure questions that really has to be addressed. Well, thank you very much both. We're nearing the end of our time. Um, final question uh, for you first, Simon. What's the kind of grand vision going forward? What are you know your top priorities for healthcare, for healthcare leadership? 
I think there's probably three for me. One is as much as I see value in different prof- in each profession learning together um, as a kind of psychologically safe space. I'd like to see more interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary training. Professional tribes are really strong, and I think sometimes we know what to do, but we don't know how to be and how to work together. So if people can learn together, I think that they can then work together in future. So that would be one for me. I think we really need to understand what's holding people back and making sure that we level the playing field as much as possible. And we we talked about that earlier, didn't we? Things around digital inclusivity and other other things around accessibility, uh, making sure that people are supported because some are in a more privileged position. I recognize myself in that, that are able to access opportunities more to learn and to develop. And there'll be many doctors like me who perhaps have a bit of a head start. So we definitely need to think about that. The final one is to recognize that there isn't probably one best way. Um, Medicine, I think, does have a bit of a typology of this is how to be the best doctor and standards are really good. But leadership really is situational and contextual. So we have to leave room for people to develop differently. Yes, we do need standards. Yes, we have, you know, expectations about poor behaviors as well that we need to get rid of. But let's leave it open so that people can actually follow things that interest them and, and lead in their own different way. Thank you, Simon. That was brilliant. Uh, and for you, Menka, your your top priorities. Yeah, I love that, uh, Simon. I think um, we really want to, um, you know, we're trying to embrace equity, diversity, inclusivity, uh, justice, you know, anti-racism and anti-oppression in both our provision of care and, uh, you know, how we treat each other and how we approach our uh, health uh, systems and society. And I think that applies to, you know, our approaches to leadership development, that we really need to honor uh, the different, the strengths that everyone, each person brings to the table, uh, that individuality, uh, rather than the sense of fitting in, and really support uh, those, all of us to uh, both have a sense of belonging and to thrive. I think the work needs to be done um, collectively. And so we really need to build, continue to build relationships, uh, build networks, and then connect those networks, whether that be, um, you know, concepts of the global north and the global south, um, building stronger connections across countries, and really looking how, uh, learning uh, from each other in terms of uh, the different approaches um, across uh, jurisdictions. And um uh, really embrace uh, both the importance of context and building a culture that values uh, leadership uh, as one of the important aspects uh, of healthcare um, delivery and practice. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for your time today. It's been really interesting hearing um, you know, your thoughts around medical leadership and, and healthcare more more broadly. So thank you very much. We'll put links to your uh, extensive uh, you know, pieces of work in the show notes. So I, I encourage our listeners to take a look there. Uh, keep an eye out for the next edition of BMJ Leader, um, which uh, Dr. Chan is, uh, is a, an associate editor, uh, and the next uh, edition of Healthcare Management, co-edited by by Simon Morali. So thank you both so much and uh, we'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks for joining us today on Healthcare Leadership in Action. Remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. And if you want to learn more about what we're doing at the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management, sign up for our newsletter at fmlm.ac.uk forward slash sign up. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Healthcare Leadership in Action.